you everyone, and it's so great to see all of you here. Um, I'm really excited to talk today with Howard Post, but I want to, you know, we were talking about this a little earlier. Did you ever watch the, the night show, the Tonight Show or the Late Late Show? This is kind of one of those formats where it's very relaxed, and so if, uh, you know, we get a little off track, I think it's okay. But, um, you know, I just wanted to tell you how I was first engaged with Howard Post's work. I worked at the Buffalo Bill Center of the West in Cody, Wyoming, and they have a piece in their collection called The Feed Trough, and it's about 80 or so high, 60 wide, pretty big piece. And I remember looking at this piece and not really knowing much about Howard Post at the time, and I was so enamored with the blue. He had this blue sky that was so layered with different colors that to the naked eye, well, from a distance, it was very blue, meh, blue. But when you looked at it, there were so many layers and it was warm and it was welcoming and there was so much to it. And I thought, wow, this guy really got something. And so when I actually met Howard, I realized that his work is just like him. It's warm, it's welcoming, and there's many layers. Wow. <laughs> I, I, I'm a deeply superficial person. <laughs> <laughs> and so when we decided, the Tissot Museum of Art decided to put this show on, you know, I think it's been about a year's worth of back and forth of many emails, phone calls, lots of different planning on my end, sitting behind the desk trying to figure out which pieces and how many and how large and Howard on his end being behind the easel and just working away and answering those many emails and many phone calls. And you know, as, as any artist does when they're working with deadlines, they always get, hey, how's it going? How many do you have done? What are their sizes? What do they look like? And so he was really a good trooper with, with all of that. And so we really do hope that you enjoy the result of those many back and forths. Um, but of course, the star of the show really is the guy next to me, um, Howard Post, and his 30 plus year career of um, creating an idea of the West, his vision of the West. And that's where we got the title from, The West Observed. It's the way he looks at the West. And so the slides that you see behind us are <coughs> what is in the show. And so I do hope, after this uh, talk, that you will go in the gallery and see these pieces in person. Anyway, so, Howard, how are you? I'm, I'm alive and well, thank you. <laughs> you survived the opening <laughs> of your show. I have to say, by the way, about this group, I'm honored that you folks have nothing to better better to do with than your with your Saturday afternoon than to be here. So, uh, thanks for coming. So, Howard, in a in a brief nutshell, can you tell us a little bit about your childhood and really how you got the art bug? The art bug. Uh, we've told this story so many times. It's my third grade teacher's fault. Uh, we, my wife and I grew up here in Tucson, of course. I went to Davidson Elementary, which was, was out on Fort Lowell. And anyway, in the third grade, uh, my teacher entered a drawing I have done of my dad, who was a cowboy. I wanted to be a cowboy, but I, she took one of my drawings and entered it in a contest at the Tucson Daily Citizen. And uh, I won first prize, got my picture in the paper, and so I decided at that point that that was my calling in life. And uh, I wondered why all of our kids hadn't decided by third grade what they were doing. I, I couldn't figure, figure it out. But. <laughs> so you had a pretty big family. Um, what all did they do? Uh, there were four of us. My folks uh, owned a feed store at Dodge and Fort Lowell. Many of you have commented that you've been by there. Uh, they had that for uh, 30 plus years. That they sold it in the late 70s. It was, used to be post OK Feed and Supply. And I'm, I think it's OK Feed now, I'm not sure. Famous for the horse on the roof. And uh, so uh, my dad trucked in hay and sold hay to all the ranchers around southern Arizona. 
and us boys, we were the, the labor, cheap labor. And uh, so we, I grew up doing that, working in the store. And uh, we also lived out on River Road, uh, 30 acres out there, uh, where now is Brandy Fenton Park, if you know that area. After my folks died, we sold the place. But uh, that's where we grew up. We had horses and cattle. We, we were involved in the sport of rodeo since the time I was young. Uh, Twelve, I think, was my first junior rodeo. So. so tell me a little bit about this rodeo. What did you do? Uh, we were mostly ropers, but uh, on into high school, I competed in all the events, uh, bull riding, bulldogging, all the roping events. Uh, they have high school rodeos all around the state. Uh, and uh, I ended up being the all-around champion in 1965. And he says so uh, humbly. And uh, <laughs> it's, it's a bad habit I haven't gotten over yet. I'm working on it. But uh, so anyway, uh, then I went on to U of A. Uh, U of A had a rodeo team. Uh, intercollegiate rodeo was big around the West. Uh, and well, even in Texas and Midwest. So uh, we. There was a six-man team, and they sent us around uh, in the western states competing in, in, in intercollegiate rodeos. Then uh, I think about 18, I got my pro card, so I started competing in the uh, Pro Rodeo Cowboys Association. So did you get injured? Uh, I broke my arm once, bulldogging. So. That's about it, really. That's about it. And the head injuries. It's, uh, and the <laughs> if we see you twitching, we'll know. Yeah. Yeah, so roping is, is your sport, huh? They still, uh, all over the United States, they have the World Series of team roping. There's probably a couple hundred thousand people that compete uh, amateur type events, but it pays big money. There's uh, an event in Las Vegas that I have gone to several times uh, in my division. It pays 300000 to win that event. So, wow. so uh, a lot of people compete in that. You have to qualify to, to go to it. So. Oh, I see. So you're still participating, huh? Uh, less than I used to, but still at it, yeah. Oh, yeah. OK. So let's get back to your work for, for a minute. And now, if you That's what my wife says. Get back to your work. <laughs> <laughs> Poor Marilyn. <laughs> but so you were growing up, and your brothers and your family was all involved in rodeo and cowboying. Wasn't that what you were going to do too, or what happened? I well, I I wanted to be a cowboy, of course, but I knew I was wanted to be an artist. So uh, when it came down to it, I put the rodeo on the side and focused on my career as an artist. And, uh, mm. I actually had a scholarship to go to N NAU, Northern Arizona, on an art scholarship, but my dad said, no, this will be fine, because he needed me to work there at the <laughs> store. So, so I went to U of A, which was, which was fine. It was, it was a good thing to do. Yeah, and you studied, um, what was your degree? A bachelor of Fine Art. I, so I, I always wanted to be a painter, but everybody said, you know, you can't make a living as a painter, so I'll be an illustrator. So I. I focused on illustration, and and uh, that's what I studied. And uh, but you also rodeo, so it's kind yeah. of a strange yeah, combination. Yeah, that was weird. Yeah. yeah, in the art department, they thought I was weird because I was a cowboy, and the and the rodeo guys thought I was weird because I was in the art department. <laughs> so, uh, well, we still uh, think you're yeah, weird, but it's you. okay. <laughs> yeah. So then, when you got your bachelor's degree. What came next? Uh, we had a great professor, Carl Helt, that uh, actually worked with uh, different uh, employers, art, art uh, studios and so forth, and they came in. And uh, So when I graduated, I had an offer from Hallmark Cards in Kansas City, and I also had an offer from the LDS Church Art uh, Publication the Department in Salt Lake. Uh, and uh, that, I ended up going there with them. Was there three years, and uh, as an illustrator, basically. And 
Uh, about that time, uh, Carl Hilt and the other, some other professors called me and said, hey, we got some, somebody on sabbatical for a couple of years. We need you to come down here and take this faculty position. So, so I did, came back to U of A and uh, taught for a couple of years. Uh, so, uh, did you like teaching? Yeah, teaching, it was good. I, I was barely older than the kids I was teaching, so it was a little awkward, but, uh, um, and I, I'll have to say I was probably like most uh, art faculty, they're a little bit um, resentful because when they're teaching, that means they're taking time away from them producing their own work, you know. Uh, and they all told me, but you get over that about, Ten years in, you get lazy and you don't even want to work anymore. You just teach, you know. So, so, so stopping teaching was probably a, a uh, good thing for me. I, I probably would have gotten lazy, but then. Sure, sure. So that was a great opportunity for you to come back to U University of Arizona because yeah. you went back to school, right? Yeah. Basically, uh, found out I could take uh, graduate classes really cheap, and so I started working on a master's. And uh, basically, they said. We want you to do a body of work, you know. And uh, this, of course, was a great breakthrough for me. Uh, at the time, I was trying to imitate my heroes, which are the cowboy artists of America, which are some great artists, but I was frustrated because I was wanting to imitate them. But yeah. one of my professor friends said, hey, I want you to throw out all your magazines, your books, forget about all that stuff. I just want you to go out to your dad's place and do some paintings that are based on your first-hand experience right? and, and uh, so that's what I did and when I had done the first series of pieces I knew I'd found my my little direction my voice you know so, was sure. so talking about the cowboy artists of America who from that group were you most inspired by early on? Uh, Snydow or Snido. Gordon Snydow, yeah. yeah. He always thought it was cool. I mean there were bunch of them, um, fellows, you know. Fred Fellows? Yeah, they I could name most of them. I, yeah, I, I know, I, go down I, the list, I right? admire the, their work a lot. So. But they were very, their styles were very tight, very traditional, realistic. And so how did you defer from that style? How did you find your voice? I just started painting as direct as I could, you know. Uh, not trying to tell a story, just responding to images that I saw. You know, I took my camera and went to the corrals, the feedlots, uh, all over with my camera. And, and without any preconceived notion of a story or anything like that, I just shot a lot of photos and uh, then would pick out images that really gave me a buzz and, and do those. So there's no, there's no storyline. And although if there is, it's accidental, I guess. Sure. <laughs> I love how you say that, it gave me a buzz. So what does that mean? Well, it makes me want to spend uh, a week or two working on a piece, you know. I mean, mm -hmm. it's torture if you're working on something that is not really of interest to you. Yeah. Although as an illustrator, that's what we did, but there was a check, there was a check sitting right there. So that was, that, that was motivation to keep working on something. As an illustrator, I mean, we did everything. I, I did cars and refrigerators and, uh, you know, just, about everything, so. Yeah, so when you were doing your masters, uh, did you have to write any kind of thesis, or what, what did you have to do? Uh, yeah, they said write a paper about somebody, some artist, I, I picked Wayne Tebow, and uh, uh, learned a lot about him. And Tebow was known for his cupcakes, and ice cream cones, and these very brightly colored uh, paintings that had this this kind of glowy effect, yeah. right? Yeah, I learned about uh, his background uh, was working in the drama and uh, he worked the lighting for uh, dramatic shows. And so that's when he discovered that real strong lighting and uh, also discovered the edge quality around images and the shadows, which he called halation, a vibrant edge. And uh, so in, in his work, when you see him outlining the edge with yellow or gold or whatever, you know, that's, that's what he's trying to achieve. And so uh, I, like a number of artists, uh, were attracted to that and tried to achieve that same 
feel in my work. Yeah. So um, you would name him among your early influences when you were finding your style? Definitely, yeah. I never did cupcakes, uh, <laughs> but I, I never did. But definitely his approach to things uh, was uh, something I admired, yeah. Sure. And he's from Mesa, Arizona originally, so. Yeah. yeah. It always comes back to Arizona. Yeah. Yeah. Can never leave. The center of the universe. Yeah, that's <laughs> right. So there was this tradition, uh, transition, excuse me, that you had from being an illustrator to being a full-time artist. How did that happen? Well, as I, <clears throat> when I left uh, the U of A, my thesis show uh, had a number of, the, a group of these uh, paintings, which were my breakthrough, I guess, and um, a lady named Elaine Horowitz, who owned uh, the biggest uh, contemporary gallery in Scottsdale, the most well-known anyway, the cutting edge contemporary gallery. She had seen my show and so she contacted me and said, hey, how would you like to be in my gallery? So That's great. I thought that was pretty cool. And uh, so that was my start. But uh, at that point, you know, the, uh, <clears throat> they, had, they weren't selling enough to support us. So I, I took a job uh, working in an ad agency up in Phoenix as an art director. So we moved up to the Phoenix area. And, um, but I also was doing freelance illustration. So uh, at one end of my studio, I had a drawing table and I did the illustration. At the other end, I had the easel. And when I wasn't uh, illustrating, I was painting. And I usually did that mostly late at night, you know. Did you mix them up sometimes? Pardon me? Did you mix it up, up, up your easel <laughs> sometimes? <laughs> I, I'm, I'm easily mixed up, so sometimes I, <laughs> so I wouldn't forget which end I was supposed to be at. Yeah, right. but, uh, so, um, so gradually, uh, as the galleries, there was other galleries. And, uh, for an artist, once you get out there and people see it and there's something fresh and new, then you have a lot of people approaching you wanting to represent your work. And so I had other galleries as well. So I. I round off to 1980 as the time where I kind of officially became a, a painter as opposed to an illustrator. But okay. So, you know, you touched on this <coughs> a few moments earlier when you said you paint corrals. Your nickname is the Corral Man. So how did you get into painting that subject and other subjects of ranching, and ranch, ranch scenes? Right. Well, as I mentioned, uh, just going out uh, to all those places and responding to the imagery that uh, attracted me, and the thing I realized that attracted me was the linear quality, the abstract quality of the fencing. Um, also, uh, fields, if you get up a little bit higher, you know, uh, cultivated fields have a patterning linear quality, which that attracted me as well. and. Uh, uh, so it's always been a, a fetish of mine, the linear quality of, of fences and... and uh, You're always looking for patterns and design, even in something as organic as, you know, a mountain? Yeah. It's, it's not consciously, any, I mean, not, I'm not sure where it stopped being a conscious thing. I, early on it was conscious, but over the years it's just a subconscious thing for me to look for those things. So are you, more, do you consider yourself more as an abstract painter or as a Western painter? Abstract Western painter. <laughs> <laughs> I know, consider your audience, right? Uh, actually, I don't, I try not to label myself. I leave that to the writers and critics to do that. Uh, People like me, huh? Yeah, Christine. <laughs> what do you label me as? <laughs> New West, contemporary West, kind of. There you yeah. go. Yeah. So, um, yeah, the abstract qualities uh, are of interest to me. The other thing, the element that attracts me is the light quality. You know, uh, if you go out in the midday in Arizona, it's pretty dull. You know, it's just this dull mm -hmm. thing. But so early in the day or late in the day, it's uh, it gets pretty magical out there in the in the West. Well, anywhere really, but in, particularly in the West. So those are the things that attract me. Sure. And one thing that makes your work 
well, a few things that make your work mm -hmm. unique, but one in particular is the bird's eye view that you sometimes, that aerial perspective. Yeah, yeah I discovered that uh, kind of by accident. So early on, uh, I would go to like the rodeos that I used to compete in and places like that. And uh, since they knew me, they I could get anywhere I wanted. I'd get up on the corrals, up on the catwalks. And as I one time was looking down and saw the the riders down with their saddles and horses and stuff and the shadow patterns, it was a, these abstract qualities, which that's what attracted me. But then after they were abstract shapes, there were cowboys and horses. So, so sort of like found objects, you know. Um, I hate to mention the word Picasso. I mean, I'm no Picasso, but uh, he was always looking for found objects, you know, that uh, in nature or in man-made man things. So I consider them found objects, found design, you know. Okay, uh, I like the way you put that. So let me bring up something that maybe artists dread, being compared to other artists. Often your work is compared to Maynard Dixon, Hopper, even Manet. If you look at the book that, the big fat book on Howard Post, he's compared to several artists. So what do you take when someone compares you to someone like Maynard Dixon? I love it. You love it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> on one hand you love it. The, the fact that they even <laughs> write about you, that's great of course. True, uh, true. Uh, and uh, I remember years ago, there was a big article, somebody wrote, called me the Cowboy Monet, um, <laughs> which I can, you know, that was the, ab I mean, the uh, sure. expressionist post colors. Uh, Post-impressionism. <laughs> wah, wah. That, that, that was almost going to be the title of that book, Post-Impressionism, but we, we, we got over it, so. But, uh, uh, Christine's probably referring to a quote I told her about, I, I read, uh, it says, if you wanna, wanna break an artist's heart, start off a compliment by saying, your work reminds me of somebody, you know, so. Um, obviously every artist is influenced by somebody, uh, even if it's subconsciously, so you, you can't escape that because we don't live in a vacuum. But right. so, so you're influenced by lots of people and I, we go to museums and galleries all over the country, so anytime you look at something, that it's going to seep into your subconscious and uh, probably affect you. But uh, I think an artist has to fight that. You know, you, you don't want to be imi imitation is death. I think in in the art world or in music or writing any of those creative kind of things. So right. Um, so do you have any advice for budding artists out there? My wife and I joke that uh, when our kids tried drawing and painting, we always slapped their hands and told them to be doctors and lawyers and stuff. <laughs> so, so, uh, uh, the simplest phrase is find your own voice, you know. Um, certainly you can be influenced and trained by other artists, but at some point you have to find your own direction, your own voice. Sure. I taught at the Scottsdale Artist School for a few years. I don't know if anybody's familiar with that, where they have professional artists come in and for a week and give workshops and people can sign up with whatever artists they want to take from. And, and what I realized uh, was that after that week, there were these 20 people would come out of there painting just like whatever artist they took at the class from. And after a couple of years of people imitating my stuff, because we, you demonstrate and show how you do it. And, I said, enough of that. I said, and I wouldn't let him imitate me anymore, you know. I had, right. And, and the, then the class numbers really dropped down. Cause it, <laughs> but, um, so you, you can learn and glean from different artists, uh, but you still need to find your own direction. Sure. That's great advice. Um, so you, you touched on this for, for a moment. <clears throat> How did you balance family life? I mean, you have five children, lots of grandchildren. Um, and a wonderful wife who bakes wonderful uh, baked goods, I have to say. Um, how did you manage all of this? She managed. She managed. She it's managed. all about she the managed. wife. She, she, 
So there's the story about uh, children, you know, in most homes, the mother, the wife is aware of the children and all their needs, what they like, what's going on in their lives uh, when they need to go to the dentist. And the husband, he's faintly aware of some short people running around the house. That's what, <laughs> so, so <laughs> that's, it wasn't quite that bad, but uh, I attribute the success of our family, to mostly to Marilyn, but I got involved. Uh, I coached Little League and baseball and stuff for 10 plus years, and uh, wow. a couple of our kids got interested in rodeoing, and so we have them. Uh, we have one son that went to the national high school finals uh, in rod roping, so so we were involved in that. So, wow. so we, when you had to work, did you? retreat into a studio, close the door, and say, don't bother me? Or how, what was your process? Uh, it progressed over the years. At first, I uh, used a bedroom in the house, and, and that worked badly, uh. because I, I was interfering in my wife's space, and, and when a, people came in, they were getting in the way, and it was, oh, sure. it was Those awkward. Little people. So. Yeah. Well, yeah, everybody. So, <laughs> so we rented an industrial space down the road and oh. was there for a while. And then we moved to another place and had a barn that we remodeled into a studio. Uh, and today we have a, an attached studio that, with a separate entrance, but it's right attached to the house. And okay. I have a commute of about 10 steps, you know, to get <laughs> to my studio. So. That's tough. I, so I, I think I tell people you need a private space where you can leave your projects out and mm -hmm. and not have to take them down and reset up every time you know. So. Right, so you can concentrate. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <coughs> so when you and I started this whole project, and <coughs> we said we want to put on a show that's a retrospective, but yet it's not really a retrospective. How I'm did not, that make you I'm, feel? I'm not dead yet, right? Yeah. Yeah, so, so, so. <laughs> Getting close, I guess. <laughs> you know, for, all, for those of you who aren't aware, this show actually has three venues. It opened at the Booth Museum of Western Art, and then it came here, and then after it closes here, it's going to the Desert Caballeros in Wickenburg. But it was curated by TMA. And so, you know, this has been a, a fun endeavor with Howard, learning about his process, visiting his house a few times. Poor guy, he probably couldn't get any work done. Um, so I was just curious from his end of things on how it is to work on an exhibition when you have so many things going on with your own career. You have gallery deadlines and art shows and things going on. How do you make it all work? Um, well, I'll interject here, a little patronizing thing. Christine was great to work with. She, oh. she, 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 she was sensitive about all those things, about not interfering with my work, and, uh, and uh, made it pretty easy. So that was a nice thing. So making it all work, uh, artists don't have a set schedule, right? So I mean, uh, as long as you get the work done, you can do it whenever you want, you know. Uh, I try to be as disciplined as I can. Discipline is not a word my wife uses for me much, but uh, <laughs> I try to get out there by 9 in the morning, get working, and go as long as I can during the day. But when there's interruptions and other things going on, uh, if i am really got a project going that I'm excited about, I'll try to get back out in the studio late at night, like 10 or so, and then work as, oh, okay. uh, another session during the night. Yeah. That, that habit started back in the illustration days where you'd get an assignment on Monday afternoon and they wanted it uh, Tuesday afternoon. And so you'd stay up all night and work, uh, you know. Right, and you just study. develop your own yeah. schedule. So, For sure. Um, but it, it wasn't painful. It was great working with you. Oh, thank way. you. It's not just because you're saying that in front of a ton of people. <laughs> 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 so, Howard, what? What, what do you want to tell everybody here about this exhibition? What do you feel they should take from it when they look at your work? They should take one of those paintings. Uh, <laughs> they, uh, <laughs> well said. 
<laughs> and I, so I'm going to get this out of the way. So Mark Sublet at Medicine Man Gower said, whatever you do, mention my name. So, <laughs> so I mentioned it. That's, uh, that's it. So, no, I, there are some of the pieces are for sale, but um, I think it's cool being representing the 40 years of work in there. You know, that's for an artist to look back at those and see those pieces again and see how you progressed and changed and uh, through the years is is pretty cool for an artist. So it doesn't happen too often. Yeah, that's true. So. So one last question before we start the little mini tour. Um, 50 years from now, if somebody's looking at a work by Howard <coughs> Post and they're a curator like me or an art historian out there, what do you think they're going to say? Well, uh, uh -oh. <laughs> I, I, she didn't uh, pre-feed me these questions, about, <laughs> by the way. I, I saw it. Um, while I'm thinking of that, I'll tell you the, the story that I heard years ago. They asked this famous artist toward the end of his career what if he wanted to achieve immortality through his work. And he said, well, heck no, I want to achieve immortality through not dying. That's what I said. <laughs> so, but, so, uh, uh, I'd like people to recognize that uh, this uh, body of work with, had some integrity, you know. Uh, it came from inside the artist rather than uh, influenced by external people, you know. So. Sure. And, I don't know, I just responding to the West, uh, doing the best I can, making it look like I wanted it to be, and um, no, no ulterior motives, uh, no um, hidden messages, no, no political agenda there, just responding to the West. Well oh, said. the West Observed. Yeah, that's the name of it. Yeah, he, he said it so well. Yes, yeah. the name of this show is His West, His West you know, The West Observed, which, by the way, you can buy a catalog. <laughs> Shameless plug. So we're getting ready for our what we're calling our <coughs> mini tour, um, where Howard and I picked some highlights between the two of us that we want to talk to you about. And then afterward, we'll have some Q&A, and then we can be available in the galleries to answer questions one-on-one -on -one with all of you. So we do want to make ourselves available for anyone um, out there who just wants to sign, you have Howard sign a book or something like that, we can do that afterward. So let's see if the clicker works. <coughs> okay, so. Let's, let's see if my neck works. There. Yeah, <laughs> uh, cattle truck. You did this in 1981. Why did you want to talk about this piece? Um, I thought that was a landmark piece, pretty representative of my interest in abstract qualities of things and the, the linear quality, of course. Uh, couldn't get much more linear than <laughs> what's going on here. But, uh, so um, I don't know. I just, we love that piece, or I love it. Our daughters, our kids are starting to lay claim to uh, some of these paintings. and. Uh, our daughter here in Tucson has laid claim to this one, but um, uh, the abstract quality, of course, uh, is there. And uh, I don't know. I mean, it's, it's you can even say it's not really a Western piece. It's it's very abstract. Yeah. The thing that yeah. gives it away is the wheel in the yeah. side. Yeah. yeah. So uh, I did a whole series of cattle trucks. Uh, <laughs> my favorites were the ones that had manure splattered on the sides. You know, those, uh, those. From experience, maybe. Yeah. No, we did have some with a, like that. There's some in the book. Uh, with manure in the book? The manure in the book. <laughs> <laughs> OK, this is one that, that I picked um, <clears throat> to talk about, Strawberry Roan. It's one of my um, favorite pieces in the show. And it's the first piece you see when you walk into the exhibition. And one of the things that I'm very drawn by in this piece is the unique palette that Howard uses. If, I don't know why that moved. Um, but it has a purple horse. Hmm, is that natural? I don't think so. Can you tell me about your palette? The, uh, 
You mean the colorblind thing going on here? <laughs> that was a little bit of a lift. Uh, I, I didn't pay attention in the color theory class in school, I have to say. Um, all my color is just a, a natural response, you know, I, whatever I want to make it. Uh, and um, the fact that it has a lot of purple in that horse is, uh, I just felt to be the right balance, you know. Sure. I didn't go in there with a preconceived idea, I'm going to do a, a purple horse, uh, you know, I just, just intuitively, I guess. So. Sure, you also do groupings of horses fairly often, or other animals. Yeah, I, I love the uh, color combinations you get when you, a group of horses are together or cattle grouped together, um, like the cover of the book, you know, the just, um, again, that found color, the shapes, patterns, right. that, that's what intrigues me and catches my attention. Uh, yeah. but, but I, I'm not trying to manipulate it, but I, I just respond to it to, as best I can. So. Um, I've heard that you've referred to these type of paintings as ranchscapes. Uh, not this kind. There, there are actually uh, the pieces that, that have. That, that's almost universal, you know, where there's a uh, a house, a barn, some trees, maybe a couple of those tall poplar trees, you know, and those are almost universal across the country. Okay. And uh, so, as we've traveled, I've taken a lot of photos of those different ranch headquarters, and. Um, those are the ranch scapes. Those are the ranch All these other things are found on ranches for the most part, but mm -hmm. the ranch scapes are uh, the, those, those uh, approaches. Okay, let's look at the next image. 19 extras. So you have 19 posts. T posts. T posts. S anybody know what those are? Anybody driven one of those in the ground uh, out there? They're okay, all right. So, so uh, yeah, I. Uh, um, this was, what, what's the date on this one? It's uh, uh, 2013. Yeah. So, uh, four or five years ago, I just caught my attention to focus on, and I did a whole series of pieces based on T posts and other, and wood posts as well. But, um, and uh, I love the rhythm, rhythmic quality of, of them. Uh, I confess I took some of these and leaned them up against there, you know, and, uh, we'll just then start uh, photographing and and responding to them, and uh, you'll see uh, several, I guess, in the show in here. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, so, uh, so uh, the Phoenix Museum uh, had a show for a while called uh, the uh, gosh, I just forgot what it was, a contemporary Western show that I was invited to. And so, uh, one West year, West Select. West Select. Thank you. Anybody go to that? No? Okay. So, uh, I guess that's why they stopped doing it. <laughs> <laughs> well, you two Sonians aren't allowed to go to Phoenix, right? I don't know. <laughs> so, that's right. Um, anyway, so I decided to, so that each artist is allowed uh, for like five pieces, so I decided to make every one of my five pieces uh, these based on the posts. Oh. And, uh, and uh, I thought it, I had fun with it, and uh, and people were like they c didn't know what to think of it. And uh, by the end of the night, everybody was saying, "Oh, posts, posts!" Uh, you know, <laughs> and, uh, if I have to hear that joke again, I'll. I'll, I'll well, you're the one that brought it up, not me. I know. <laughs> so anyway, that uh, I've enjoyed that. Uh, I still do it some occasionally, uh, but the idea is sort of work through me. Uh, you know, subjects come back. I mean, I've, there are subjects that I did in 1980 that I haven't done for years, but I get interested in them again, and so we'll revisit them and look at them with a, a new eye and a fresh approach. And, sure. Yeah, so. Okay, the next one is the shoot that you did in 1990. They, um, again, uh, going to the rodeo grounds, uh, and just responding to the imagery that was there, and uh, this, I was being a little more playful with the uh, coloring, uh, with the yeah, paint. Yeah, it's very bold. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, looser, 
I think back in the early days, uh, some of the pieces I was experimenting with a looser approach. And you seem to have more of the visible halation in this work. Yeah. Like you were talking about the Tebow influence is a little more prominent around the figure. Yeah, yeah I must have just seen a Tebow show. I don't know. Maybe. <laughs> I don't, I'm not sure why exactly, but uh, um, yeah, same thing, just responding to imagery that I found as I was going to rodeos. So this, this was never you. This is a model that you saw no, a photograph yeah. or? I, I never had models really. You no. know, I would always just used found objects, found people, you know. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And you don't really show faces. Is there a reason? They, um, you'll f a few pieces over the years you'll find faces. I, I found that if you put a face in one, of course, then it becomes a portrait of that individual and that becomes the focus. I mean, if you have a full-on face, you can't get away from it. That's, that's your focus, you know. Yeah. And, uh, and I didn't want that to be my focus. I wanted the, the overall piece and the, to be more universal, you know. Sure. And, uh, I can do faces and, I, you know, I've done portraits, uh, commissioned portraits and all that, so. Um, yeah. In case people were thinking he, he can't do noses or something like that. Right. <laughs> Challenge accepted, right? <laughs> Let's look at the next one. So this is the bronze fixing fence. So wait a minute, Howard Post doing bronzes? What's this about? Yeah, uh, I hope uh, my client isn't here. To, I'm sure he isn't. But <laughs> Back in uh, what's the date on this? 1990. Okay, so right about that time, uh, a rancher down in South Texas uh, commissioned me to come down to his ranch and do some big paintings for his new home. <clears throat> and so I, I did those. And when I was d down there installing them in his one big room, he said, "Oh, this is great." He says, "Now all I need is a big bronze to go with it." He says, "You don't happen to do bronzes, do you?" And I go. Well, yeah, yeah, I do bronzes. <laughs> <laughs> so, so well, it wasn't exactly a lie because I came home and, uh, you know, started working, got clay and, and uh, started working at it because uh, I didn't know everything about foundry. I still don't know that, but uh, working in clay and uh, I really enjoyed that. And I uh, produced a, a bronze for him and uh, ended up doing about uh, six or eight different bronze editions. Um, the thing about, there's two in the, in the show here, of course. Uh, I never could, I missed the color, you know. Right. And, uh, and uh, getting patinas that were colorful without, I, mean, I know there are artists who paint their bronzes and I, I never wanted to do that. But, so uh, I haven't done any bronzes for quite a while. So. And you just missed the color, so that's yeah, color was, one of the main uh, yeah, so. reasons you didn't go back to that. And they're expensive to produce, of course. I mean, uh, if you, my friends who are sculptors, they have, they'll have a couple hundred thousand dollars of bronzes sitting around in galleries, you know. So that's uh, sure, sure. Let's check out the next one. Now, this is one that I picked to talk about. <coughs> this is um, on the Amazon from the Magic Boots from 1994, and it's a pastel. Can you tell me a little bit about this? This kind of sticks out a little funny from the rest of the yeah, pieces. Yeah. Obviously, yeah. So uh, a friend of mine uh, who was also uh, representing my editions and had been a writer at one time. We, we decided we wanted to produce a kid's book for our kids and grandkids, and, uh, and on the side, we'd become rich. Our main motive was for the kids, but on the side, we wanted to become rich. <laughs> well, sure, writing yeah. a kid's book would do that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, so anyway, we got together and brainstormed for quite a bit of different ideas. And uh, um, the, the one we came up with, the magic boots, which is almost autobiographical for me, you know, because in this book, the kid wanted to be a cowboy and he wanted to travel the Amazon River and so So anyway, uh, we came up with a script and I did two or three uh, illustrations of parts of the story and submitted it to, um, I'd say a dozen different publishers before we found one that wanted to take it on. Oh. And uh, so 
So uh, we kept some of the originals, but I sold most of them. And, uh, and uh, then we learned the hard facts about publishing, <laughs> and particularly publishing children's books. So this book sells for, well, this might discourage you from buying it, but I don't know. <laughs> so it sells for $15, uh, so the, the author gets about 30 cents <laughs> after that, you know, they... That's why they have to buy your paintings. <clears throat> yeah, so yeah. between the distributor and the publisher and the discounts and all of that, so it's... So we didn't get rich, you know, <laughs> but, uh, we, but we have this uh, kind of an heirloom for our kids and grandkids. It's, it's third grade reading level, so I really enjoy it. <laughs> and, uh, it's, uh, so, uh, it's a beautiful book, if really you have, is. If you have some grandkids that you need one, uh, Oh, one little thing about it. So uh, uh, I got a notice one time that this book was uh, given, uh, made the top ten list for the hospital association kit, uh, books to use for kids who are in re uh, rehabilitation. Mm -hmm. So this was that was oh, that's nice. that was kind of cool. So. Well, anyway, that's the have, story about that one. So. Yeah, we have that on view with a copy of the Magic Boots so you could see where it was published in, inside the book within the galleries. So take a look at that. <clears throat> Last piece we wanted to talk about, New Lumber at Rolf's. Rolf's. Rolf. Rolf. Yeah. That was done in 2014. Okay. So Rolf's place is about five miles down the road from where we live up in Queen Creek, Arizona, which is between here and Phoenix. Uh, Rolf and his kids uh, lease a big ranch out there, a few sections of desert land, and they run cattle on that. So, so but it's on a main road, and there's these uh, great old corrals that I've used as subjects for 20 years now, I guess. You mm -hmm. know. Every time I go by, I look and see if there's something new going on, if there's a new broken board or, or something. That's getting old because they've replace the lumber now with pipe you know, oh. and, and pipe is not nearly as interesting I, I have done pipe pieces you'll see in there but it's not as good as lumber you know so the, the more organic quality yeah, more of organic the lumber is so. more attractive so uh, anyway and and uh, there's a, a pile of new boards sitting there in this piece so new lumber at Rolf's those are the superstition mountains in the background there and so, so. <clears throat> So that wraps up our mini tour. How about if we do some Q and A? Does anyone? Mean, it's just way louder. <laughs> so Mariana has the microphone. Does anyone have questions? Okay, we'll go with your part. Oh, there you go. Um, Mr. Post, thank you so much for being here. Uh, kind of two questions wrapped into hopefully one, Christine, if you'll allow me so. <coughs> Um, you <coughs> tend to, you did, some, we have some sketches in the museum, in your show, but I think I read somewhere that you don't necessarily always just do a sketch. You like to kind of go right to the painting. Do you, I know you take a lot of pictures, can you describe uh, whether those sketches are critical to each work or, or how do they fit into your, your whole, whole portfolio? Yeah. For a long time I didn't use sketches other than just idea of thumbnails and uh, it, more and more these days I seem to be doing sketches with a little bit more detail just small sketches like 8 by 10 sketches uh, that have content and and uh, scale so then I'll I'll uh, photograph those with my digital camera and then I'll have a projector and I'll project those little imageries up on the canvases whatever size I want to, to use and that's my that's an old illustrator technique, you know, to, to do that, so I don't know if that answers yeah, that. Yeah, that's course. great. Just want to be accurate when we <laughs> But I've used all different kinds of methods. Those are just techniques, methods to get your uh, drawing onto the canvas, you know. The old traditional way, of course, would be to, to uh, hand draw it all on there, but that's really time consuming and, and not the best way in my opinion. Uh, so. Great. Thank you. Well, I have to ask another quick one. Um, you will. I know. You have a lot of pens uh, in your work. 
And I know that there's a rodeo competition called Sort and Pen, which is sorting the cattle, obviously, and then pen. Did you ever uh, compete in that? And is that something you think of when you do a lot of your pen and sort work, sort pen work? Oh, it, yeah, that, that's a, a relatively modern uh, event, it's sorting, team sorting, and uh, which is not really a, in rodeo, it's a totally separate uh, competition level, you know. So basically, uh, there, there's no relationship in the titles there, but uh, okay. sorting pens on the ranch are like, uh, there's one guy at the end of the alley with a gate, holding the gate and there's different pins and the guys will call out number one or number two and they'll sort the cattle into those depending on the weight or the age or you know or size of the animal you know so that's how they sort on the ranch but this team sorting or team pinning is a timed event where they uh, if you want to know about it so they there's three <laughs> three guys on the team and uh, they have a whole herd of cattle down at the end with numbers on them and they'll uh, call out a number and then that team will have to run down there and they'll sort out that number cow and they have to get it back to the other end of the pen as fast as they can and it's a timed event so I've never done that it's uh, we do roping for real men that's what it is. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, uh, yeah, don't, I'm just teasing. About it. <laughs> I'm kind of curious if you ever went out into ranch country and set up your easel and drew, because your lighting is always magical. I've done some plain air things at the request of my dealers. You know, they have these plain air events in different parts of the country where you go in for a day and you paint all day and then you bring the pieces back and they have an auction or something like that. And I've, I've done that uh, a few times, but it's so impractical, you know. I mean, the elements, the wind, the light, the dust, and uh, a lot of my pieces are larger, of course, so that's, that's not a workable thing, you know. And uh, so I don't really do that anymore. I, ha I have done it, though, but... Uh, I observed after seeing this for the first time a little while ago that the paintings um, that went from 2014 to current, for example, 19 extras and around the river bend, you went from post-impressionism, the dabs, I could see the dabs of color, particularly when we first enter um, in the Strawberry Rose, to a blending and a losing of the brush strokes. Have, has that happened intentionally? It's also much sharper with definition because of that. Yeah, I've noticed that myself, but it, it, <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it wasn't intentional. I just. Just a, a natural progression, you know, um, and uh, I'm I'm into surface quality is of much more interest to me these days, and so I I'll work in like four or five layers. So I I'll put down a layer, let that dry, put another layer on, let that dry, and, and so it, it tends to blend itself a little bit more. The the pieces early on that had the more expressionistic brush stroke that. Those are done more wet and wet, you know, so, uh, but this new way I'm working seems to end up being blended a little more. I'm not trying to blend necessarily, but it, that's the end result, you know. Glazing. Glazing, yeah, that's, uh, um, yeah, not intentional really, but I don't know. Good Sometimes question. I like the old stuff better. And seeing all these things uh, going, how come I can't paint like that anymore, you know? <laughs> <laughs> but, but, I don't know. Thank you. Um, I have a question regarding the emotional drive, I guess I could say, of <coughs> what your next piece is that you want to work on. Is it, is it a matter of 
something feeding at you, like I can't wait to do this, or is it I haven't I haven't done this for a while, or oh I like that photograph. I don't know. I guess I just it's a bottom line of of what inspires you to go into that room and pick up those brushes and and do whatever is next in your heart. The, the answer to what inspired me, we used to say the house payment, but, uh, <laughs> but, but we've got the house paid off, so we're, we can't use that anymore. But uh, so uh, uh, we still travel, and I still take photographs, and hopefully some new imagery will be fresh in my mind, and and I hit on one and go, yeah, I, I need to get home and paint that. Uh, but I have a you know a bank, a file of thousands of photos. And, and now with the digital thing, you know, it's a lot easier. So each time I'm starting a group of paintings, I'll actually go to the same bank of photos and edit through those until something sparks for me. And it may be an image that I've seen, you know, 20 years ago, you know, and, and it'll just seem fresh and interesting to me at that time. So um, I don't know if that answers the question, but. Uh, and I, I don't just work on one piece, uh, I work in groups, so now that I've been around a while and I'm in more shows and with museum shows, uh, um, there's deadlines and so you have to kind of plan it out, you know, which is a challenge for me to, to plan out the year of pieces and so I even have to take canvases and put little notes on them for me to say, this one's going to the Tucson Museum, or this one's going to the booth, or this one's going to the uh, Prita West in Oklahoma City, you know. But, Do you want to uh, tell them about your next big show coming? Then we, uh, arms are, okay. The Idle Jordan, anybody heard of the Idle Jordan Museum in Indianapolis? There's some people from Indianapolis here I met yesterday. So anyway, the, <clears throat> every year in September, the Idle Jordan has what they call a quest for the West, which they invite to, uh, I'm going to say if I'm rounding off to 50, it may be more or less of artists to come in and that we're each allowed to bring four pieces and they have a show and uh, patrons come in and they have a silent auctions for those pieces and a portion of those proceeds go to the museum and most museums are doing that these days to help defer the costs. Anyway, so at, at these shows they give awards and at the Idle Jordan this last year they they gave Howard Post the Artist of Distinction Award, which included a one-man show this coming September. So, so, so and since uh, uh, Christine had already borrowed most of the work that's out there uh, from nice collectors, uh, and I can't use those because they overlap. No. So I have to. We have to find new people to borrow. <laughs> it's a good problem, though. Yeah, yeah. No, it's, it's cool. It's an honor. I'm, I'm, I guess this is the year of Howard Post. And, That's right. So don't, That's for, don't forget me after this. I'm still in the business. <laughs> Anybody else? I think we have one here, Kurt. Yeah. Better be good ones. I just had one question about your painting with the cowboy um, in the ring in, in the corral with the straight down on his hat. The shoot? The shoot, yes, the shoot. In the foreground, there's a metallic piece, a pointed metallic piece, like leaning up against the fence, and it draws the eye straight up to the cowboy. Did, was that accidentally leaning there, when you, or did you place so, that there on purpose? So, is this the guy bending over? The sh we're talking about the same piece. The, he's on the shoot, so. on the shoots. Uh, yes, yes. Okay. Looking down the top of the hat, yeah. no face. So the the triangular piece yeah. at the bottom. And the foreground. Yeah. 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 There you go. No, uh, on the on the shoots they they number them, you know, mm -hmm. shoot one through seven usually, and so. So that's perfectly positioned. You see that it draws my eye straight up. Cool. Well, yeah, I, I, I can't, I can't say that. Well, I'm, I'm assuming that it was like that. But, uh, yeah. That one was 1990. Yeah. It was all on purpose. Yeah. <laughs> you planned it. 
That was another life, 1990. <laughs> no, that was another life. And there's one more question, I think. Yep, I have one more. You've been around horses your whole life, um, and I look at old horse, old barn, and white horse at auction, and old paint, and red, and I, I wonder uh, if you have an emotional response to horses, is there something special about them for you, or is it more that they're partners, or the colors, as you were saying earlier? Yeah. Somebody analyzed that once for me. <laughs> they said, this guy doesn't really care about the horses, they're just objects for him, like three-dimensional objects to, to uh, render, to paint, you know, so. That's only half true, I mean, I, I really respond to horses and find them satisfying, you know, I still have a couple, and, and so I enjoy being around them, so. Uh, there's still an emotional part, but I guess in my painting, I almost treat them like objects, you know, shapes, patterns, colors, you know. Um, I'm not looking for sentiment. If there's sentiment, it, it's, it's snuck in there, you know. I, I'm, not, I'm not trying to be sentimental about them. I, I don't know if that answers your question. I'm thinking about the romanticism of horses in the West. Yeah. I'm not into that too much, but uh, <laughs> Okay, I guess that wraps it up. Thank you so much.